morning, Washington. I've been wanting to say that all morning. <laughs> Um, great, well I'm glad I am in the morning, otherwise I would have had you do a, a little exercise for me, do a little dance with yourself. <laughs> okay, well our topic today is Operation Cyber Wellness. Um, it is a, there's a lot of topics here that I am truly passionate about, um, and you'll see that I might start dancing a little bit, I'm really excited about this, <laughs> and I hope you are too. So the first exercise, I am going to ask everyone to do a little exercise, um, it's not dancing, it's not an actual exercise, but I want you to get out a piece of paper, if you have one, or your computers, or gadgets, if they see everyone has on the table, um, and just go ahead, there is a purpose for this, trust me, I want you to write down the first five things, three to five things that come to you when you see me up here, um, what you feel, what you observe, or what you think, there's no judgments here, at least on my part, um, I'm not going to ask you for what you wrote down, uh, I'm not going to ask you to share it among your friends, it's just a small exercise. So just go ahead and write it down, <laughs> three to five things, just really quick. Just give you guys one, 30 seconds to, to do that, and trust me, there is a purpose, trust me, we will get to that in a few, few minutes. Mm -hmm. There's no right or wrong answer, anything that comes to you. <laughs> All right, so hello, I am Josie Dugar. Um, I always find it interesting when people introduce themselves and the only thing they say is their role in the organization of the company um, they're with. So it makes me think, is that really all you are? You're just a CIO or you're just a CISO or you're just an architect, is, is that it? Or is there other parts of you? So I like to introduce myself as there are a million parts to me, um, but these are some of them. I am happily married, I have three beautiful kids, two, five, and eight. Um, they are awesome, we also have two dogs. And I am also a dance director for a uh, school for children um, in Virginia, and I love dancing, it's my passion. Um, and I also own a holistic wellness practice, and we'll get to that in a little bit of how that started, but that is a big part of who I am. And lastly, I am a CISO um, at the National Institutes of Health Clinical Center, which is um, the largest biomedical research hospital in the country. So these are just five parts of me, not ten. If I sit here naming all a million parts, you'll probably be sleeping. Okay. Um, why does this matter? And you'll find out uh, as we go along why all of this really matters. Okay, short personal story. I see a whole lot of guys in this room. This might be a little TMI for you, but I'm sure you have women in your lives, <laughs> or you will at some point, possibly, um, or you know of them. <laughs> so I had a very uh, recent story with my last born um, child. A, um, a very incompetent OB had performed my C-section. Uh, she was probably not awake when she did it. So I ended up with double hernias, 12-inch uh, 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 hip-to-hip incision, um, a whole lot of massive uh, scar tissue damage, um, and a large abdominal separation, which is otherwise called diastasis for time. Um, again, this is part of my story, and it has truly changed my life. Um, for the good, believe it or not. So I learned a lot from this experience. I couldn't walk for about a year. I couldn't carry the baby for about a year as well. Um, and with an experience like that, it does truly change you as a person. And I took that to, to heart. Um, it's changed my life, uh, the way I look at life, the way I look at my health, and also how I look at cybersecurity, um, my work in the work perspective. So this does matter. Um, and I know you're probably thinking, what does this have to do with anything? But we'll get to that in a second as well. <laughs> we will, trust me, no, we keep saying that. Um, okay, so for the longest time I thought about why does this matter, how did this happen, um, and what went on. Um, for the longest time I couldn't figure it out, but uh, lately I have come across a lot of research and a lot of studies that talk about physician burnout. Um, and just take a look at the quick reasons here, I'm going to name all of these, but just too many tasks to do, like ad administrative tasks, too many hours at work, um, lack of respect, which I found um, 
a little interesting. I would have thought that uh, uh, physicians regard themselves very highly, but apparently they do have a lack of respect from comrades, patients, and even others that they work with. Um, and just too many computerized technologies. They are physicians, clinicians, they want to uh, you know, help cure patients, but they don't really want to sit there dealing with computers all day long and the, all the new technology that comes with it. Um, and they do feel like they're a cog in the wheel. Um, apparently they feel too tired, they don't really see the value of what they do. This is all recent studies, not me saying this, um, that I just want to get through their day. So can you imagine being the last patient of the day and you're having major surgery? Um, and your physician is just, you know, he just wants to go home, he or she just wants to go home, and he just wants to kind of knock things out. Um, and maybe they're not really invested in your own um, health. Um, high pressure um, comes with high stakes, and with that comes with um, a very high risk of depression, mental illness, um, and everything that goes along with that. So if we take a look at the numbers, death by medicine, which includes um, uh, operations as well as just over uh, diagnosis with uh, prescription medicine and antibiotics and just unneeded medicine that we, we tend to get these days from medical doctors, is the third leading cause of death in the US, to about 250,000 deaths a year. Again, why am I talking about this? What does this have to be a security? Well, let's take a look at the next slide. Cyber security professionals burn out. Look at the reasons for this. Again, it's not me. This is some, this comes from recent surveys and studies that have, that have been put out there. Very similar reasons. Too many administrative tasks to do. Too many too much bureaucracy, red tape, especially in the federal government. Too many hours at work with never-ending battles. You can, I have never known a security professional that has gone home saying, I, I uh, remediated all the vulnerabilities today. I am done. Tomorrow I'm going to come here and just do another task. Never happened. Um, lack of respect. So it is hard as a cybersecurity professional to get validation from your own peers as well as management because you're kind of in the back back end there. Um, so unless your organization got hacked, um, that's 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 you know that's what they're looking at. You don't really get the the um, in front uh, of the boss type type of um, relationship sometimes. Um, and I wrote patients in here because I work in healthcare, but um, you, know, you could have a lot of respect from your own team members. Um, and it is a very competitive type of um, environment. Um, so you have that going, not really the way through either. Uh, increased computerized technology. Uh, so it's the same kind of reason that we see in healthcare, you also see in the cybersecurity world. Just all of this new computers, IoT, everything that comes with that. You have to learn it, you have to learn it quickly, and then you have to figure out how to secure it. Uh, high adversity, mistakes are costly in those environments. If you make a uh, mistake in the operation, it can cost someone in their life. If you make a mistake in cyber security, it can cost someone their life if it's in healthcare um, or a DOD. Um, so very similar reasons, shortage of skilled workers, which we'll get to in a second. Um, why is there going to be a, a, a such a big gap in the number of skilled workers we need in security um, by the year 2021. And again, high pressure, high stakes, tens of burnout. Um, and the last line there, the cultures that foster burnout, and when they're not really taking care of their people or looking out for their people, um, are paying for that. They might not realize it, but the companies that foster burnout cost them 10 times more than absenteeism. Um, kind of off the side there. Um, so, <laughs> Just by having employees that come to work, but they're, they're just completely burned out, they're, they might not be giving you 100%, it's actually costing you a lot more than just people that just aren't, aren't there. Okay, so what can we do about this epidemic? So, <laughs> it's a little bit of a funny slide, but it has some truth to it. So if you look at this, everyone's putting out fires. Physicians are just putting out fires, cybersecurity professionals are just putting out fires every day. Um, and then, if they're not putting out fires, if they're just trying to take care of what they know, compliance, this and that. Um, so I'm not saying you have to do the yoga tree pose in the middle of your day, um, <laughs> but it might actually help. Um, but what we're trying to say here is we do need to take some time to really look at our people. So thank you, for Francisco, for that, because your talk beautifully led into mine. I should take you with me wherever I go. Um, <laughs> but again, yeah, just looking at it from a human perspective, um, and we'll get to that in a second. Just taking the time to to look at it from a mind, body, energy perspective and seeing how, which, you know, uh, 
calming things down, taking a moment to, to just really think about things and just um, you know, calming your mind does help. And we'll get more into that. So where that leads to is looking at it from a whole person point of view. Your entire person comes to work with you. It is impossible for your mind to just put your family life or your finances aside and then just um, come to work and just do what you're supposed to do. Likewise, it's impossible for you to take what's going on at work and then just put it in a little compartment in your head and forget about it when you go to work. It, it does affect you. Their, your mind, your brain is, is a million pieces put together. So you, you're bringing your entire person to work. So at the NIH, we do have a really good program for workforce well-being. Um, if, if your companies or agencies don't have this already, I would strongly recommend that. Um, it is available for all employees and contractors. Um, and where we really look at um, financial well-being, physical well-being, social, community, um, and your purpose. If you don't see a purpose in what you do, you're just not going to feel 100% doing that. Um, and there are different programs for each of these categories at the NIH. If, you're, if you have worries about financial <laughs> well-being, there are different programs that you do. Um, you can uh, look into physical well-being, and it's not just about exercise, it's about your, your whole self. Um, there are multiple programs about that. Your relationships in your life, that this is all part of you. So you want your wheel um, in your mind to look like this, you know, a, 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 a well-pumped wheel where all of these I'm little the factors top, top. are in balance with each other. Um, and note, if one aspect of this um, gets affected, maybe your finances are, aren't too great, it does affect your entire wheel. So now your wheel ends up looking like this. <laughs> and you really can't ride that everywhere successfully. Um, so, and purpose is, is one of the main key items. There are tons of sur uh, surveys out there and studies that show that if you don't feel a purpose to what you do in life and in all of these areas, um, it's just not gonna get you very far. Okay, so Francisco talked a little bit about this, but there is a connection between your mind, body, and energy in you as a person, as a whole person, um, but also in an agency or organization. Um, and we kind of see the similarities here. So just a personal exercise for everybody to do. Um, if this was in the afternoon, I would have had to, had to do it right now, but this is in the morning, so we're not expecting everyone to be awake. Um, Next time you feel upset or mad or tired or angry or just not in a good mood, just do something physical. You know, get up, do some jumping jacks, go for a walk, come back, and do something physical and just notice if there's a difference. There will be a difference um, because your mind, body, and energy are all connected. So if you change your physiology, you will change your emotions which come from your mind. Um, and that is actually how I got through the two years without needing any additional surgeries that the surgeons had told me I needed. They said I needed five additional ones. I didn't get a single one. Um, and I've never been to a doctor since then. So it's two years now. And I'm in the healthiest and most optimal health that I've ever been in my life. And it's all because of this mind-body energy connection. So how do we bring that to cybersecurity? As Francisco said, the mindset, if you think of the mindset of your management, you think of mindset of the people in the organization, um, people that work for you, and your own mindset, that plays a big part. You know, doing a, looking at things from a holistic point of view, being mindful of what we do, um, that really plays a part. And then if we look at the body as the technology, are we really putting the right tools um, for the right purpose, or are we just getting distracted by shiny objects? There are a lot of vendors that do great things, but then they also sell products or services that seem awesome and amazing, and then we end up using about 10% of that product. Or we find that we have multiple tools that do pretty much the same thing, but they might have some little aspect of them that are different. Um, and then now we have about 20 agents on our, on our computers that are bogging down time. Um, artificial intelligence, there have been a lot of studies out there recently that talk about artificial intelligence for in the healthcare setting that would actually help with the physician burnout. Um, so instead of clinicians sitting there typing take notes while they're talking to you, they're not really giving you personal attention. Maybe there's a robot or if there's a software program that's just recording everything you say, everything the patient says, that says, and just and putting that in the computer. 
that'll actually save them all a lot of time. So it's just one way of looking at it. Um, and we can start looking at that from the security perspective as well. What are some administrative or bureaucratic things that we're doing, having to do now, that we can just get a software program to do for us and kind of buy us time to do our real job and really secure the organization? The energy, the culture of the organization, as Francisco said, that is that plays a crucial part, probably one of the biggest parts. What is the energy of the organization? Um, what is the diversity of the organization? And it's not just about women versus men or race. Um, we'll talk a little bit more into that in the next couple of slides. Um, but the social emotional maturity of the organization. So as somebody mentioned, you know, when you get uh, you there there are a lot of people that are very skilled at the technical level, but they have about zero emo social emotional skills, and that does play a big part. Um, the freedom to innovate and create. Are we just checking off the um, the boxes for compliance reasons, or do we have the freedom to innovate in our organizations um, to really drive that person, um, or or the organization for higher standards or modernization? Do we have the, the freedom? To um, empowerment of staff. Are we empowering our people at all levels to um, to uh, uh, to innovate, create, but also to do the right thing? Um, in security, what I found was working for a hospital setting. If you didn't empower your clinicians, your nurses, even your patients about security, what it brings to the table, how to do their jobs. Um, securely um, and just have this in their mind, it is all the burden gets on the security team. Then it becomes, oh, it's, it's only the security team's job to secure the environment. You really have to make it everybody's, uh, on everybody's mind. Even the patients, we had patients, um, you know, download BitTorrent and start, you know, screaming things and we had to really, you know, I have to provide some sort of uh, brochures and education at the patient level as well. Okay. So I've been, after this whole approach um, that I came up with for my healthcare, I actually started kind of changing that, um, or tailoring that approach to everything else as well, like <coughs> security and to my to the organization. So what I found really worked well, which I think we're kind of touched on as well, is the whole integrative medicine approach. Um, it's not just one solution. It's not just one way of thinking. You really need a, uh, all parts of the puzzle would fit together and look at it from different points of views, look at multiple solutions, services, um, and, and see how they all kind of fit, can fit together to, to get a good solution. Um, so part of that is diversity, the emotional maturity of organizations and people, the art of communicating, speaking the right language to the right person. If you go to clinicians and talk about security, it's going to sound like German to them. You need to know how to con convey your points to the right people. If you go to a CFO and just talk about how you need all this money for social security, again, it's going to sound like German to them. You need to uh, find a way to communicate to them in terms of money and cost and how you're saving them money at the end of the day, not how you're spending money for them. <laughs> um, the psychology behind the security. So there is a psychology behind uh, uh, cybersecurity. Um, just understanding the dynamics between male and female. Um, if you go to a male CIO, you have to kind of tailor your approach a little differently <coughs> than it was a female CIO, or a CISO, or anyone, really. Um, and we'll get a little bit more into that. I know you guys are dying to see the differences. <laughs> um, finding the root symptoms uh, and solving the fire wise. I think Francis could touch on that as well. Not just buying things for the sake of buying it, not because Oh, it's a good cost, or hey, we have this issue, and this one tool is going to resolve that. We really need to ask the five whys. What are we trying to solve here? What is the main issue? Why is the system rated at a high physical level? Does it really need to be a high? What's going to happen if we um, if we rate it as a moderate? And just because we've had this dynamic where I've had to explain to my CIO, just because you deem a system as a high does not mean that system is going to meet all the high controls, um, especially when you come. An environment like ours, healthcare, you can have a Philips IV monitoring system, and you can call it a high critical system, anything that you want, but everything has to do with the manufacturer or the vendor, and they're going to say, this is an IV pump, and we're not encrypting the IV flow to the patient. How do you do that? 
So just because a game is system at a certain level does not mean it's going to meet those requirements. We really have to ask the five whys and then figure out what's the best way to really secure that. Um, how do the arts and creativity play into the technical fields like cyber? You'll be surprised. Um, so as I mentioned before, I am a dance director. Um, and as part of my dance uh, company at some point, we have had to teach uh, kids with um, physical and mental disabilities. Um, I am not saying anyone is physically or mentally disabled here. But there are a lot of skills that come with that. How to be creative in teaching them. How to really understand what they need and tailor um, uh, what you're doing to them. So when we come to our organizational perspective, the creative side, um, your, your right side of the brain is your creative side. Um, for those that have very, are not very creative, you're also not really going to bring in all of that um, innovative creative skills and technology side. So just being technical and only using the left part of the brain, that you're not really using your full uh, brain in that perspective. So we've actually had uh, students that didn't really have a technical degree or technical focus, but they had a excellent creative and um, innovative ability in, on the artistic side. We, we've actually brought them uh, on board to um, learn the technology, and it's been amazing. <coughs> it really does play a part. Okay, so they said, it's a science of diversity. It's not just race um, or gender. There is a, a lot of aspects when we talk about diversity. Diversity, your ethnicity, um, geography, where, you know, either which state or which uh, country you're from, your culture, your skill diversity, like I said. You know, if you bring in your artistic and creative side, how does that play a part, um, as well as your uh, technology side? And also your social and emotional skills that we talked about. Um, how does that play a part along with your technical skills? And I have no problem sending these slides out to anyone, so feel like a big And yeah, your age group, your <coughs> social and economic status, all of this plays a part. Cognitive diversity. So when we talk about cognitive diversity, it's a diversity of thought. Um, so by bringing in all of these different parts of you um, into an organization, these are all the things that you're going to do. The creativity of the organization itself, um, the source for novel perspectives, um, coming up with new things, innovative ways of doing things, your decision-making skills as a person and also for the organization, uh, problem solving, even financial decision-making. There's a lot of studies out there that talk about you know, bringing in a diverse workforce, how that actually increases um, the uh, financial status uh, of the organization. <laughs> so let's take a look at the last bullet there. Facility, uh, facility, uh, actually, it's probably wrong. Uh, facility friction. Yeah, should say facilities. My bad. Um, uh, friction that enhances deliberation of and conformity. So you would probably wonder, like, why do you want to bring friction into the mix here? But just think about this. Anyone that's ever been a naysayer in your life, anyone that's told you we can't do this, or you can't do that, or doesn't value you, what did that make you do? Does that make you stick around and just say, OK, that's it, that he must be right, or she must be right? Or does that actually make you want to change and maybe um, get better at those skills, or figure out, like, hey, maybe this is, I need to take a different direction? It actually does make you a better person by, um, or maybe take, it causes something in your life to happen that will actually might be better for you, versus just staying in the, the, the comfort. Nothing good has ever come about by just being comfortable. It always takes something to kind of urge you to that, uh, or nudge you to that panic point, um, or looking at it from different points of view, that something uh, amazing could come from that. And implicit bias. Why is it? Why should we care? So implicit bias is a form of bias that's not really intentional. Um, it can be, but most likely it's, it's not. But it can stifle um, good organizations um, and good people from either entering your workforce or staying in your workforce. Um, it's a barrier to diversity and inclusion. Um, and it could be a very small systematic bias, but it can have a huge impact. So let's take a look at the next slide. 
we see what we look for and we look for what we know. And that's why we need to bring in all the diversity um, into our organizations and actually into our mindset. Because if we just keep looking for what we want, we're, we're just stifling ourselves and our organizations. So let's go back to that first exercise. Take a look at the five things or three things that you wrote down. Does it still accurately reflect? Do you still feel like that now? Has anything changed? Um, and it's okay to have implicit bias. There's nothing wrong with that. Everybody has it. I have it, you have it, everybody has it. It's just understanding it and understand that you do have it and then we see some thoughts or some maybe even some judgments or opinions that come to your mind when you first look at someone just kind of putting that aside for a second and really getting to know that person. Um, you know, you might uh, feel yourself being surprised by that person or, you, or you'll, you'll find yourself being empathetic or really understand that person as a whole. Okay, so this, um, where are the rules in cybersecurity? Um, just by recent uh, surveys, we're still about 14%, some say 20, but I think they're looking at um, other areas, not just cybersecurity, so this number really hasn't changed. When I went to school um, in electrical engineering, I, had, I was the only female, the entire class, uh, things like that. Hasn't really changed a whole lot. Um, I brought a Roshni with me, who's uh, also on my team, and um, uh, about to be a graduate, and also hasn't changed. There was about two or three females in, in engineering classes still. Um, uh, just take a look at some of these numbers. 20% of U.S. tech jobs. Only five are in leadership roles. Um, the predicted gap in cyber jobs globally is 2.5 million by the year 2020. Um, <coughs> but we may not be looking in the right places to fill that gap, and we'll get to that in a few seconds. In elementary school, yes, there are STEM programs, but even the teachers aren't, um, what, what we've noticed is that even the teachers aren't really um, encouraging or empowering girls to stay in STEM programs. By the, by the time they're in fourth grade, they kind of lose interest or they feel like they're not, this is not for them and, and they leave and there really isn't a, a, um, a big urge to, to uh, empower them to stay in it and, and make them feel that they can't do that. And that last bullet there, one third of students' social media posts of girls in STEM were sexist. Most were shared by girls themselves, which is very surprising to me. Um, actually, it's not very surprising. Um, women and girls can sometimes be the harshest critics of each other. Um, instead of trying to empower each other, they kind of think of each other as competition, um, and they're really not in it to, to help each other out. And it's <coughs> at a very young age, even from uh, an elementary school perspective. Uh, so. Last Sunday's New York Times magazine the cover story was women in computing, and it pointed out that historically coding was a was a woman's uh, right. uh, occupation, yes. whereas building hardware was uh, attracted uh, the boys and men. Yeah. And why did that change? Because these are in fact the current the, the current statistics, and the article goes into where the transition was and why women sort of lost interest in uh, in uh, computing careers. We take a look at that. I've heard that as well. That, that some of the previous NASA scientists were women, but it, uh, that trend seemed to kind of. But during the Second up. World War, for yeah. example, all, 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 all of the soft jobs were, were women's jobs because they could deal with the details better than, yes. than, than uh, the men. Yep, we're going to get to that slide next. <laughs> <laughs> we're out of time. Thank you. <laughs> um, or in another slide, we will get to that. <laughs> but this is some of the reasons why uh, um, women and girls are being stopped from moving into technology fields. The number one reason was lack of confidence and the fear of failure. Right from a young age, when you have a uh, a girl, you know, if they if they're running around going crazy and, and they're about to ride their bike, the first thing that comes out of mom's like, hey, be careful, don't ride the bike until, until you know how to ride it. <laughs> um, versus if it's a boy that's kind of just going crazy and running around, like, oh, okay, pick yourself back up, you're good, it's all good. Um, and it starts at a very young age, um, and it kind of continues until even at a at a when you're mature women, you have that you have that confidence that. Uh, or a lack of confidence that you know you feel even if you are the top-notch person in in the company there's always a little fear in you that mm, 
do I deserve this? Am I not good enough? Um, is everyone going to resonate with what I'm saying? There's still that the fear of failure. The number two reasons we look at that is a lack of advocates, men uh, from the female